If we are now live, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's exercise. And this is a reinventing the tattoo exercise, but we're also allowing uh, general public in as well for this round, um, just to kind of give them a taste. And so hopefully we've got some people from the public here. I'm gonna go ahead and flip my camera around now so you don't have to look at my ugly face anymore. And here we've got our uh, screen view. Now I'm using Photoshop tonight. I know most of you are probably using Procreate. And so I'm gonna to try to translate whatever, whatever I'm doing into Procreate terminology as much as I can. Uh, and I know also some of you are using old fashioned uh, analog you know, pencil, etc., which I can't say enough good things about. So uh, whatever your approach, uh, let's get rolling. But first of all, I wanted to talk about our original reference, right? So we've got this thing here. And this is, um, you know, kind of a generic flat photo. It's got nice colors and a nice mood. It's very sunny. But if somebody were to get this tattooed, it would all be very ambient. And you wouldn't really have a center of interest in the, in the piece. So you can see the, the difference here. I've taken that bottommost flower and I have uh, just kind of blown it up and uh, re-outlined it. But I also did a little bit of, uh, now there's a filter called Liquify, which I don't know what the, uh, what the uh, equivalent would be in, uh, procreate. I know there's some kind of equivalent where you can take a brush and basically do this. This is the liquify filter. You've got a brush that you can use to move things around, right? Kind of stretch and distort. Highly useful, right? Um, and I know they've got something like this in procreate as well. So I did a bit of that with this flower as well as just the uh, making it much bigger. And so the other thing that I want to do is make a quick custom palette. So I'm going to open this up again. And I don't know what the one step way would be to do this in Procreate, but I'll show you what I'm doing here first. Um, hang on, let me zoom in there. So We've got this uh, small version of, of our reference image, right? And I'm going to go to filter, pixelate, mosaic. And whoop, wrong layer. Look how impressive I am. Okay. Uh, filter, look, no, pixelate and mosaic. And I picked this trick up from uh, Alex Ruiz, who uh, is a really uh, great illustrator and concept artist. I've set it to about there, what do you think? So this kind of really radically simplifies the, the color scheme of, of the uh, image. It kind of gets rid of the image itself and just gives you a color palette. So to do that in Procreate, I think you would have to uh, open your photo in an extremely low res file, you know, make something that's like 20 by 20 pixels uh, in size and open your image in that so that it looks like this and then just, you know, expand it to fill the whole screen. And you, you might have to screen grab it in order to increase its pixelation, its pixel uh, resolution without fuzzing out all the edges. But anyway, this is going to be my color picker for this. And, uh, it's on a separate layer. So, okay. We have uh, these background flowers and we're, I'm tr trying to imagine this as a moderate size tattoo, let's say shoulder cap-ish size. And so this central flower is gonna stand out pretty boldly in front of the rest. And I want the ones in the background to kind of fall back. So I think all of these uh, outlines, uh, ultimately I'm going to hide. So I'm treating these just as a stencil that is gonna disappear behind color lines. Also, I just wanted to say for the record, this is gonna be sort of a speed painting exercise. I'm gonna to try to keep this to maybe 
uh, an hour tops. All right, so let's see. I'm just looking at this a couple of times, but I don't want to get lost in that original reference because it is fairly indistinct. But you can see the top edges of these, we've got a clear neg on pause relationship. We've got these darker greens behind it. And I think I'm gonna to go to more of a gray green than that a little bit, just so that the uh, foreground colors, these uh, golds end up being uh, a richer and more saturated uh, hue than the color that we use in the background. But I'm still gonna go with this kind of neg on pause relation, relationship where it's uh, relatively light and open in the upper sides of these. And then the bottom half of these, I'll kind of flip that logic, go with a pause on neg, where the bottom edge of this is going to be dark and the background will be a little bit lighter there. So I'm going to start by just kind of blasting in that background. Use this handy dandy color picker here, kind of cruise around and see what we have available. And if you are doing this in Procreate, you would do the color picking by uh, by touching your finger down and holding it. If you're new to Procreate, that is a way to avoid having to keep going back to the, uh, um, the palette thing over and over again. Oh yeah, I need to also create a new layer. This is something I can't say enough uh, things about is you, you do want to make sure that you've got distinct layers when you're working. Uh, you can kind of condense them later when you find there's no real reason for two layers to be separate layers anymore because I try to keep my layer count to about 10 or less. But definitely having a background layer, a foreground layer. Okay, and also this, like I said, I wanted to go with some less saturated gray. So I am gonna make use of this other color picker here where I can kind of reduce my saturation some. So uh, some of you may be familiar with something that Russ Abbott made, uh, this uh, color wheel that was specifically matched to uh, the Eternal color palette. And I think he's expanded it to be kind of like the, just a more of a general tool. But uh, his, his philosophy behind color is he really tries to uh, choose one major color in the piece that's going to be your, your saturated, vibrant color and keep everything else uh, a little bit duller. So in this case, following that logic, I'm going to try to make the foreground flower the brightest and the red layer of flowers behind that, the ones that are gonna be out of focus, are gonna be a little bit less saturated and bright. And then finally, this far background that I'm kind of blocking in right now, we're gonna be going more towards the, the gray greens, something a little bit less saturated still. So uh, it's kind of descending order of saturation. So when, when talking about priority, the idea of visual priority, now the purpose of it is obvious, we wanna, make sure that the viewer notices the important things in the piece. We also want the piece to be interesting to them, so we don't want them to miss the most interesting things about it because uh, there are background elements that are competing for attention with the important foreground uh, subjects. So part of uh, the idea of priority is just to make sure that it's obvious to the viewer what they're supposed to be looking at. Okay, another thing about this background I'm making right now, because it's gonna be on its own distinct layer, is I can uh, then mess with the saturation using the hue saturation function. And I know that there is an equivalent to that in Procreate as well. Okay, for those who haven't caught my previous uh, workshops who are photo uh, Photoshop users, some quick keyboard shortcuts. I love keyboard shortcuts to make your brush larger and smaller. It's the parentheses keys. To uh, make them softer or sharper, it's the parentheses keys while holding shift. And 
the numbers one through zero are 10% through 100%. Extremely useful uh, things to know there. All right, so this still, this isn't gonna look like much at first, right? I'm using the eraser to get rid of all my overspray. And then I've got the uh, background flowers. I'm gonna do the same with them, but I'm gonna make the eraser a little softer edge there because I'm gonna let them start to drop out of focus. Another thing with this, we are translating it to a tattoo design. So one of the things I'm gonna be doing is using outlines selectively. So in this case, I'm going to be using outlines in the, uh, <clears throat> in the, the boldest outlines in the foreground flower. These middle ground flowers, I may use some outline. I'm gonna kind of play it by ear with that. And then of course these far background, uh, stalks and stems um, there's no need for them to have any kind of noticeable outline so how often do i actually do full color references uh, when i'm tattooing it depends on the subject matter and a lot of you know like many artists i do a lot of uh searching around on the great google and uh looking for things to kind of jog my imagination. And I try really hard not to just say, oh, that is really cool. And just, you know, sit down and trace the darn thing and, and make a tattoo of it because uh, somebody else had already thought of it, right? And uh, if something is really great like that, I will often, uh, you know, screen grab it or whatever and take it with me to the drawing board and and I may copy some elements from it because really I'm trying to put together a, a tattoo design. And if there's something about that reference that's going to translate beautifully, uh, I should take advantage of it. But uh, I do want to mix and match enough that it still feels like I'm creating a, the design and I'm not just co-opting things that other people have already come up with. It's a very tempting thing to do, right? There's so much amazing stuff out there. And uh, sometimes clients will just come to you with these things and say, oh, look at this dragon here, this is amazing. And uh, yeah, if it's a nice piece of art and you wanna duplicate the piece of art and contact the person who did the original and get their blessing and all that, uh, that's all well and good too. But this is all ad about adapting things and we're translating this into a tattoo. So this is one of the other things is, is it's almost unavoidable that we end up tattooing in our own hand, right? I mean, how can you avoid it? Well, I think realists kind of sidestep that by having a methodology that almost eliminates their own hand from the, uh, from the equation. So you're, you're, uh, going through a process of, uh, you know, translating that photo. And of course it, you know, you can tell a Phil Garcia tattoo uh, versus a Steve Butcher tattoo versus a Nico Hurtado tattoo, right? Uh, so their own hand is still there to some extent, but the fidelity to the photo is so strong that uh, that really becomes the important thing about the piece. Here, we're not really worrying about that. We're just trying to make a really good design. And in fact, uh, not getting too lost in that original photo is probably uh, for the good. Okay, so there's a really rough background. Um, let me also just real quick knock out these stems. If uh, people want to let us know where they're beaming in from in the chat room, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, well, since we have a functioning chat this time, let's let's hear where you're from and how long you've been tattooing and you know, anything about yourselves. One thing about the Reinventing Live channel is we're trying to bring back some of the mojo from back in the, the day when people still really were active on the forums where, you know, now it's a different day and age and we've got all these great live video capabilities and things like that. So... Uh, instead of uh, you know, the, the forum kind of option, we've, we've now got 
you know, like this live channel. And we actually have the ability to invite people to drop in and you know, join the chat. We can have multiple screens up. We've got a lot of options here that we just uh, uh, didn't have in the old forums of the past. So we're just starting to really tap into the, the capabilities of these new media and incorporating that into our, uh, our reinventing platform. All right, I'm creating a new layer and I'm gonna start working on uh, this one. I'm well, let me bring this down here so you can see what I'm doing. This one I'm gonna call background flowers. And that's gonna allow me to uh, keep a, keep track of what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm gonna keep the background flowers a little bit duller and I'm not gonna go quite as high contrast as this foreground flower. So you can see in the color picker here, there's some brighter golds and then you've got some kind of, you know, darker and less saturated ones. So that's what uh, I'm gonna start with is uh, one of these, it's kind of a, let's see. We'll see how that looks. And I'm also gonna take another real quick look at this. And the only reason I'm looking at it now is the distinct shadows, right? There's a few distinct shadows, which sometimes look nice to include in your flowers. Um, you can see like this one here, this one here, a little bit of that one there. So I'm gonna try to keep that in mind because those are good for your, for giving it uh, you know, structure. In fact, I'm gonna just make a copy of this. So we've got Illustrative Man coming in from Arizona and Tavon's here, uh, Tavon Krieger from Santa Rosa, California, tattooing professionally for the past nine years. Right on, glad you guys could drop in. Uh, Tavon posted a really cool uh, um, crustacean a couple weeks ago. Well, in fact, all of Tavon's posts have been very nicely rendered. Um, you can tell he's not back to tattooing yet to have time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Man, who here misses tattooing? So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start blocking in these background flowers. And I'm keeping the brush kind of soft right now. I'm still, let's see, we're already 20 after, right? So uh, I'm trying to stick with the speed painting kind of approach to this. So I'm, I'm just going to knock this in. And I'm not going to worry about overspray because this is uh, its own layer. So I can erase all I need. And so I'm starting with the farthest back petals. And I'm also going to create a white layer And Rob is joining us from Rockford, Illinois. Right on. What's up, Rob? Glad you could join us. All right. So I just created a white layer. Purpose for that is just to, I can turn it on and off and hide the outline anytime I want. So you can see how this background flower here is already just a little bit soft edged and not too sharply focused. I'm just going to keep rolling with that and the background flowers layer. And um, I'm looking at this uh, reference mostly just to see how those shadows fall and where the dark and light divisions are because there's some nice rhythms in those, but I'm going to exaggerate all that stuff. I'm not going to treat this as a realist would. Uh, let's see, I did some painting on the wrong way. Uh, okay, well, so I'm going to real quick rectify that. All right, so now I have 
merge the two different layers, the one I was supposed to be drawing on with the one I was accidentally drawing on, and then cut and paste that out of it. So, and to people who joined a little bit later, this is a pixelated version of this that I'm using as kind of a color picker. Okay, so and the reason I discovered I was in the wrong layer is because I was trying to erase this stuff. Okay, so back to speed painting. I gotta get down to business here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I'm just gonna do the background flowers only. I'm gonna go with a more saturated orange in that foreground. You can see I'm also pulling darker, more saturated colors up behind the um, top edge of this flower here because ultimately we want it to have a strong neg on pause relationship with this other stuff. And in fact, this flower here, it's pretty dark and ambient. So it's actually perfectly fine to have some elements in this that don't have much going on in them at all. And this is something that I've spent my whole career trying to teach myself to be comfortable with just the idea that yes i know it's a tattoo and i know it's skin but you don't have to pack every square inch of it with detail um, that's a kind of a bad habit that a lot of us have got to make the most out of every square inch and so <clears throat> by that thinking it's very hard to uh have areas that you leave out of focus or areas that you leave intentionally loose uh, and made worse by the fact that then your client goes to the bar and their buddies are like, hey, what's up with that part? So it really has to be done right. You know, that kind of uh, look has to be handled, uh, you know, with uh, intentional thinking. You know, if it doesn't look intentional, that's when people are going to start asking if it's finished or not. Okay. I'm actually really excited about reaching the point in this where I can completely turn off the outline layer and that'll be sooner than later. But that's because at that point, it'll be like the stencil has wiped off Another thing, <clears throat> when I'm using references, when I tattoo, and uh, I know that it's a, a very hard habit to, to break the idea of really looking at your reference, and uh, you want to get it right. And I think that I kind of learned my big lesson of that uh, one time when I was at a, uh, a state park. I had my easel and I'm painting this rock formation. It was just gorgeous, right? And the texture on it, the lichen, um, the way that the sunlight was kind of streaming across the scene and picking across the micro textures of the surface, it's just too much, right? I mean, it's like, how will I capture it all, right? And, uh, and then the light is changing before my very eyes. I'm like, oh no, it's different now shit and uh you know so i ended up hating the painting until later i got home because you know i was just looking at all the things i was failing to capture right but later i got home and i was like wait a minute it's pretty cool it actually does have some of the vibe of that moment you know and as an artist that's all you can really hope to achieve is to capture some of it you know if you can get a an impression of an emotion or of a, the way the lighting felt on something like that. Uh, that, that takes some doing. That's, that's not messing around. So uh, you don't have to capture it all. You don't have to get the perfect impression. And, and I mean, unless you're trying to be that perfect realist, you know, and, and I, I understand that too. But even, you know, somebody like Steve Butcher or, uh, or Nico, ultimately what they're doing is they have very specific ways that they interpret their photographs. And uh, so it's not really, uh, I mean, they're still having to simplify. Like Steve explained to me that he doesn't uh, like to use uh, an iPad 
to make his stencils because, you know, you can just keep zooming in, right? And so he loses track of how big the actual tattoo really is going to be. And as a result of that, it's easy to go way too detailed in something, make, uh, you know, shapes and lines that are too close together really to put in skin. And uh, there really is a kind of an optimal size for those things. Okay, almost to the point where yeah, move to the next flower. 826, moving right along. Well, that's central time. I uh, have no idea where you're all at. Well, let's see, for T it's 626. Uh, well, let's see, we've got an illustrative man uh, says, hi everyone, Arizona checking in. Uh, uh -huh. Tivon Krieger is in Santa Rosa, California, tattooing professionally nine years. And then uh, Rob Schultz in Rockford, Illinois, home of the tattoo in the world over by Milton Zeiss. Now, Rob is the guy that runs the museum at our uh, virtual tattoo gatherings. And uh, to anyone who hasn't a had a chance to drop in on his uh, presentations, uh, he usually has a few things in the schedule got a ridiculous uh, uh, collection of artifacts and uh, trivia. And I think that for this next uh, virtual tattoo gathering, may even get a, an interview or two lined up for that one. And uh, yeah, the, the next VTG, we finally have our... Uh, our lineup of artists for that, which I'm really excited about. We've got Jesse Smith, and I interviewed him at the last one, but it wasn't really like an instructional seminar. We were just chatting. And uh, this, this time, I think he's going to actually walk you through the steps of, of drawing like these action characters. Then uh, we've got Thea Duskin, and she's gonna do a, a work along workshop, kind of like what we're doing here. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what that's going to be yet, but it may be about working across different styles. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, uh, Joe Harrison is teaching painting workshop. And that will be, uh, I think, the first night. And uh, she's a really great a sort of loose, expressive oil painter. I really look forward to... Uh, I've been doing all the painting workshops, no matter how exhausted I am from emceeing. You know, it's it's just too too good of an opportunity, and I've really enjoyed all of them. And the other uh, painting workshop is uh, going to be John Clue. And uh, let's see, Jake Meeks is uh, doing a workshop on finding your style. He's the guy that does the Fireside Side podcast, and uh, Jake is a very thoughtful uh kind of you know smart guy it's really nice to hear what he's got to say and uh he's also going to be joining us for the panel the panel will be the rule of thirds we're talking about rules and guidelines that tattooers uh, live by in various different styles and on the, the title is kind of a reference to that so-called rule of thirds of one third skin, one third black, one third color that a lot of traditional artists like to live by. And I've got my own kind of rules. Like I've always had a two thirds rule when it comes to foreground and background. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned that in reinventing once or twice. But uh, the idea that you want your foreground to take up at least twice as much area as your background, in most cases, I mean, you know, there's always gonna be exceptions, right? So, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to uh, hear other artists' uh, take on that. And I think we're going to have Marcus Lenhardt in for that one. Uh, let's see, who else? Well, that panel is still coming together. Uh, we're going to try to get people from a few different styles to uh, chime in on that one. All right, almost there with these guys. I've got this one flower over here, and we will, well, we're about half past, but midway into our exercise already, so I better get a move on, right? 
Yeah. I like these. Go ahead. I was just going to say that at the next low, but I'll just take over now. I suppose real quick. If anybody has taken any of the uh, seminars at the, any of the last uh, virtual tattoo gatherings, let us know what they were in the, uh, in the chat room. Now I'll be quiet for a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm also curious to hear feedback from members about uh, the recently added um, uh, workshops that I've put into uh, reinventing, including the intensive rendering one with the crazy sleeve project. Um, I think the next thing that will be going in there is the uh, biomechanical composition workshop. And I actually recommend that to all styles of tattooing because, you know, we're trying to address things that are universal about composition. Okay, there it is. If the outlines disappeared, get it somewhere. A little bit over here, and then we'll move on to that middle one. And once we get the middle one blocked in, we can turn off that outline layer once and for all. But back to what I was saying about references, uh, it definitely is nice to have a point in your drawing process and in your tattoo process where you put your reference away. And, you know, maybe uh, take a look at it if, if you need to. But by and large, uh, try to get through the final part of the project without it. And the reason for that is just because at some point you want to give yourself that artistic freedom to just create as, as you're going. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't always do a color rendering, for example. I do a lot of shaded renderings, value studies, especially for the bio stuff. That's often all that I'll do is, you know, sometimes a very rough kind of uh, value study, but that's, that's all that's needed. I don't want to leave myself with nothing left to discover, right? That would take the fun out of it. So I'll, uh, I'll figure out the important things, but Beyond that, I don't want to uh, go too far. All right, I'm gonna also take a darker color. Let's see, this one maybe. And I might even drop its saturation a little bit. I'm gonna just use a little bit of that in this background. Okay, and I'm gonna to try to do this ultra quick. Now we're, we're still speed painting like mad here, right? Uh, so I just want to define a few of these edges. In fact, I'm gonna make another layer. And that way I can uh, decide after I've put in this color, how uh, saturated I want. I can take it down a little bit to a, to a lower transparency. Or maybe a little bit lighter, but uh, many reasons to, to do the layers thing. It's kind of funny though, because then I end up doing analog painting and even knowing better after all these years, I still try to undo stuff. I still like look up in the corner for the clock. It's, yeah. My brain has been permanently damaged by being around computers. Wouldn't have it any other way. That was actually my other life. I'm sure a lot of you have another life, the one that didn't happen because you ended up tattooing. But my other life was, uh, I would have been in programming actually had a job offer at the Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, I would have had a very different life than the one that I did have. I'm not sure if I would have been happier or less happy, but uh, I definitely would have been wearing a tie. So I'm guessing less happy. <laughs> Oh, I did it again. Uh, 
put stuff in the room. Record, I did do a lot of uh, freelance programming without wearing any sort of. Uh... <laughs> well, this wouldn't have been freelance programming. This would right. have been programming in, in the same uh, lab where uh, they helped design the atom bomb. Oh, geez. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I had to go through several security checkpoints to. Um, check out what my desk was going to look like. Yeah, it was pretty scary. I actually got vertigo as this guy was showing me my desk and I was imagining this long corridor into the future of this life and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't it, you know? And, and uh, I mean, I was interested in programming video games. That's what my thing was at the time. Big <laughs> Yeah, big difference. Okay, wow, 837. I better finish this quick. All right. But I'm sure a lot of you have that, that other life. And maybe you even sometimes wonder about it. Yeah, this guy's got a couple little uh, filaments in there. Just broke through uh, 60 playbacks, about uh, 15 to 20 concurrently. All right. Well, the ones that stick with for the whole, whole thing, hopefully are all going to be posting theirs later on tonight. And... Uh, we're going to be using the hashtag reinventing drawing group and you don't have to be a subscriber to post if you did the drawing because we'd all love to see. We've got Chris Hall coming in from PA, I think, that, is that Pennsylvania? Yes, hello, Chris. Great to see you, man. Um, I gotta fix my uh, wrong layer problem here. Yeah, Chris and I have a, a really fun collaborative painting that we're working on together right now. Um, Gabe, and- uh, Gabe, I think you're, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Gabe was just sharing his screen. It was the uh, reinventing drawing group screen. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move this guy out of the way now. We can really focus on this central flower. Let's see, we just got a little bit of erasing. All right, I've got 21 minutes left. Do you think I can do it? Woo! So, all right, first thing first, um, maybe I'll do an outline, right? And in this case, um, I think it would be nice to have a um, kind of a color gradient line. And I don't know if any of you have ever tried this, but it's difficult. It's one of those things that I'm only able to really pull off properly if I see the client a couple of times and I can sort of touch it up but where you've got a, a sculpted line that starts out black and then fades into red and fades into orange or whatever. Uh, I don't know why I do things like that to myself, but uh, I think what I'm going to do is since the bottom edge of this is closer to the viewer, the top edge is farther away. And we're trying to really play this uh, visual priority card. Going to uh, use a red outline for the top edge, black outline for the bottom edge. That'll also kind of emphasize the weight a little bit better. Now, when I do strong outlines on things, I always like to 
give the outline a really determined thickness, right? If that makes sense. Um, like a thin tribal shape. And I usually build up the line and work both edges and really try to make sure that both edges are sharp. Now when I, I'm saying both edges, if you zoom in on the line and think of it as a tribal shape, you've got a top edge and a bottom edge and an area of black in between. Uh, I mean, I go with pretty thick lines. When I use lines, I use lines. Uh, and then when you uh, grade eight into uh, red or whatever, kind of have to feather the colors into each other. So this is something I've, I've been messing around uh, with in, uh, in my tattoos for years, and I'm still trying to find a way that uh, heals as it, it, it heals in such a way that it doesn't look like I labored over it. Right? When you see people produce this beautiful work that looks like it just fell out of their machine or whatever, remember that it didn't. <laughs> and so pretty soon I'll be able to get rid of the reference, I mean, the uh, outline altogether. Wanting to do that soon. Uh, let's bring this back real quick. And I'm just going to start sketching in these other lines real light. Now, if I were tattooing this, I would probably you know what, I'm going to think more like if I were tattooing it, I'm going to go with a bigger brush. I'm going to take a quick look at a reference. Okay, because we do have a nice shadow effect here. And uh, those hard edge shadows are going to help bring the flower into the foreground where the shadows in this background stuff are softer edged, right? Um, oh, you know, another thing I'm gonna have to do is get this gold color and I'll use a Photoshop trick for that since we're not gonna have a ton of time. Um, I do a lot of things with the eraser and a lot of uh, Photoshop users use the eraser as a way of kind of selectively applying an effect to something. So you've got two identical layers. You apply an effect to the bottom most of those two layers. And then you turn that top layer on and kind of erase out to reveal the parts of the bottom layer that were affected by that, uh, whatever it is that you just did. And so what I think I'll do is turn a, a copy of the background layer, turn all the whites gold, and then I can use the eraser to reveal those. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, I think I am gonna end up going darker with this. And I'd like to get a little bit more saturated with it too. Now, this this is where it gets tricky for me, Mr. Colorblind, right? Um, but I'm not gonna let that get me down. But yeah, reds and, uh, reds and golds. Um, oh, I did it again, look at that. You know what, I'm just gonna get rid of this. Uh, reds and golds and greens. I, uh, I have a hard time with that's that's my uh, my color blind weak spot. You know they have those tests where you can uh, try to find a number in a cluster of dots, and um, I flunk all of those. I get maybe like the first one and I flunk the other 19. 
<clears throat> so I live in a full colored world, but I just, I guess I don't see it the same way that the rest of you do. That's what they tell me. It's like a couple of the colors are calibrated differently. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's funny because Brian Geckel got me a pair of glasses that are supposed to correct this. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of funny. I was nervous about trying them on, you know, it's like, fuck, is this going to ruin my, like, appreciation uh, for every piece of art I've done up to this point? I'm going to just hate it all, you know, but I had to look, right? And uh, and it, it was just so sort of weird because the greens all looked really exaggerated and neon, and, and it makes me wonder, is my own perception really that dull? <laughs> or is this just weird? Is this just like, maybe it's not a very good translation, um, you know, the people who made the glasses are just trying to get their investment back. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm cynical. About their eyes. All right. So now I'm starting to get some more contrast into this foreground flower. Uh, Damon Conklin posted a drawing recently that I think is noteworthy because it's a, um, a peony, very brightly colored, but uh, it really uses black amazingly well. Now, a lot of people would think, okay, brightly colored flower, I just I want to probably ramp back on the black a little bit, just like, pump in the color. And uh, as much as that might seem like it makes sense, Black is really uh, an important tool in making your color look brighter and uh, can make a really enormous difference in how you perceive the color. Um, so yeah, I recommend that you know at some point you go take a look at Damon's recent posts. He's uh, a Damon Conklin and he's a really badass Procreate user as well as a very fine tattooer. Gabe's actually got the, the flower right in front of us right now. Oh, yeah, there we go. Right yeah, away. Right the black, right? Now look at how that black just makes that, you know, the lighter uh, yellow just wonk. You know, it's an amazing effect. So uh, I may work a little black into this, although uh, it's obviously a much different flower, and I don't want to lose the uh, real summery, sunny vibe, right? That's that's the thing that's at risk with, with going black or with uh, too much of it. Okay, I might want to turn this um, outline off once and for all. Yeah, just about, because I've got 10 minutes. Of course, we can go longer than that if we want to. I'm trying to make these average one hour, so I know that everyone's busy. Um, plus, it's just a good challenge. Uh, working quickly, at least with your preliminary stuff. Um, Gives you a, a chance to try more different things. You know, you end up spending 18 hours on your first color rendering, you can be pretty attached to it. You may not do a second one, right? But yeah, so now that uh, we've gotten to this point, I can turn the, uh, no, not yet. Almost. I really want to turn that uh, outline layer off just because it is uh, sort of distracting. And it also makes it hard to see. Uh, you know, it's just like having that stencil that you're trying to get rid of so that you can see what you got left to do. Okay, stencil be gone. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and sample the brightest gold. And make another layer. Uh, 
I'm just going to fill it. And then I can uh, erase the parts I don't want. And so probably, okay, what I'm going to do is reduce the opacity just enough so I can see the outline again because I think that will help me with the erasing. Let's see how fast I can bust this out, right? And I'm still trying to keep this background a little bit softer, a little bit less um, rendered and developed looking. And so I'm going to have just a few minutes left to detail out that foreground flower. I would encourage anyone who is actually doing this exercise who wants to uh, post later on, I would encourage you to spend as much time on this as you want. But uh, if you do stick with the speed painting aspect of it, um, post your time. You know, when you make the post, say, yeah, this is, this is a one hour speed painting. Or, you know, if you end up spending three hours, let us know that. So those of us who did ours in an hour don't look at yours and think that we suck. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I do such a quick job with these exercises that, you know, a lot of the examples that people are turning in are, you know, significantly nicer looking than mine, you know, uh, but uh, that's, that's how it should be, right? Show us what you can do. I'm not here to show off. Right, that was the quickest way I could think of to drop that gold in, right? And we'll get rid of our outline again. This guy, we can go all the way up to full brightness if we want. Um, hmm, okay, so here's another thing I can do. I'm going to duplicate this layer. And I am going to make it duller. Less saturated, lighter. Okay. And I'm going to erase out that foreground flower to reveal the right version of it. Okay, I'm also starting to wish that I had gone a lot darker with my background, so I might kind of uh, double up on that. I'm trying to find ways of doing this all fast, right? Still want to get some detail and highlights into this foreground flower. All right. Now, let's see, what else can we do here? I think that uh, this, I'm going to make a really light yellow white and brush it in the top here. There we go. Now we can really start to get that neg on pause relationship that we were looking for so that the flowers behind it and the background behind it helps it to jump out. Okay, and then the farthest background, whatever happened to the background? Oh, there it is. Okay. That background, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it. And what that'll do, since it's a transparent background, by duplicating it, I double its opacity. I mean, it's a, its density. All right. 
and then I can uh, mess around with darkening it further in the levels. Yeah, maybe that's what we need is something more like that. Yeah, and then we can also saturate it a little less, yeah, more gray, less green. What else can we do here? Okay, I'm, right now I'm just separating my layers. All right, so what, I've, what I'm doing now is merging a couple of layers so that I can uh, get them to uh, work together. And I'm going to go ahead and select this foreground flower and kind of let's see what happens if I Haze out some of this a little bit. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I'm not going to use the uh, eraser. I'm going to use white paint and a low opacity. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and drop that out like that. All right, the clock be ticking, right? And bring some of this black outline back. Now, what else looks like it needs it? I definitely need to do something with the center of this flower. It's it's very uh, sad and dejected looking. It doesn't really have a the center of interest, which I've been promising this whole time, right? So I guess that's what we'll do next. And other thing is because this, uh, the stem here is the stem that belongs to this flower. It, it deserves some kind of outline. So I'm just going to kind of hint one in there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder if I should have gone darker with outline at the very top. I did want it to drop back some. I'm still really trying to separate it from that layer of flowers back there so let's see i think that i just need to go a little bit darker behind it and make a new layer real quick all right i'm officially at one hour here but that's just how it goes thank you all for bearing with me because we're we know that if this was a client in the chair, if it took that extra 10 minutes, make it a much better piece, we would do it, right? And so I'm kind of working on developing that pause and relationship. There, that allows that top edge to stand out way better. I'm curious to see if my own uh, Photoshop skills increase the result of doing these, but I also eventually I'll, I'll start doing these in Procreate because I should be doing them in Procreate. It would be uh, more like what most of you are doing. And I think we'd be all more like on the same page that way. It's ironic though, I uh, 
I'm so used to using this thing that I never bothered to buy my own iPad. And uh, so I have to borrow my daughter's. Uh, one of these days I'll be uh, tattooing enough to be able to justify such things. But uh, right now I just, I can wait, right? Plus, I really do love this big Wacom setup. But the more used to uh, Procreate I get, uh, I don't know. It's not that Photoshop seems out of date because it's not. It's almost cumbersome, though, sometimes compared to Procreate because, you know, I mean, it's, it's obviously trying to be the app that offers the most, you know, and you're paying five bucks for the one app and, 700 for the others so they've got to really pull out all the all the tricks and of course it's worth it there's things i would never even attempt to do in procreate because it's so much easier to do it in photoshop but uh you know, they're, they're definitely racing ahead with, with keeping up and adding a few highlights so back to phil garcia uh, his use of highlights right now anyone who doesn't follow Phil first of all why aren't you but uh, um, yeah his recent surf pieces are just crazy but uh, take a look at the way that he does his highlights they're okay so white a lot of people like to you know debate the usefulness of white and um I know that white is a viable pigment because I've got highlights in my own collection that date back 30 plus years that are still there, right? But they are um, not necessarily, uh, you know, strong or anything, and they never were, right? White is a subtle pigment. Notice how I'm working in points, not just lines. And furthermore, as, as we're talking about white here, White is most effective when you don't pack areas of it, right? So, uh, you know, if you were to look at, at Phil's work, you'll see that his white highlights are often very, you know, concentrated along edges. And often they're supported with black or dark color running along uh, either side of them. So they're really, you know, maximized in a way that, uh, you know, allows them to pop out. and it, uh, you know, even though white is a subtle pigment, using it that way, it adds that extra degree of sharpness and focus, which is what we're trying to do here. And white is the most effective in using smaller highlights, which is one of the reasons why you're seeing me using points and dots. Okay, so here we are, we're past one hour. Um, and I didn't want to get too far past one hour, but, uh, let's see if I was to do anything else, you know, just clean up some of this stuff back here. If I was creating this as a reference for a tattoo, uh, I would probably at this point, uh, kind of just go through the whole thing and, and look for places where I could clarify shapes, uh, make sure that there's no places where the foreground and background are ambiguous. Uh, make sure that, uh, you know, and, and yeah, sometimes it's okay for background stuff to run together. Back, back again to that, like, you know, those kind of built-in filters that we tattooers have. Oh yeah, you gotta make sure everything is really clear and distinct. And, um, and that's one of the things that I envy about realists is often they're they're like, I don't care. And the photo was not clear and distinct. So I didn't make it clear and distinct. It's like, okay, it looks awesome, man. Uh, where, you know, going through my normal tattoo filters, I'm like, I must make this sharp. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that doesn't help. Uh, it just makes it look, you know, like it's been processed. And uh, yeah, that, that looks a lot better with these little bits of, uh, I like doing highlights and colors, but, you know, pigments besides white sometimes it's uh 
kind of nice to uh, sometimes use a yellow white or uh, I've got these, in this, this set of pigments uh, by this guy, Halo. He's uh, one of the Ink Master guys and it's uh, one of the Eternal sets. The Halo set is mostly these light pastels and uh, you couldn't do a whole tattoo just with his set. I mean, you could, it would be, you know, pretty low contrast, but uh, they make great highlight colors. And uh, in particular, when I want to have a couple different levels where my highlights in one level are, uh, you know, not nearly as strong as the white highlights are in the other level. Okay, last but not least, I'm going to do a couple final things with this background. You know, I've probably said last but not least six or seven times, so I'm, I won't keep you much longer. I feel like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. That's too hard of a brush. I'm going to soften the brush. And lower the percentage there. I think that that fringe of white is distracting, and I'm going to just tone it down. There we go. And then I gotta figure out what layer the spillage is on. Erase some of that. Okay. I think that I almost can just call it quits because I know that uh, I could keep going, obviously. Okay, so another thing, let's say, you know, without getting too far down that rabbit hole, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, merge some of these layers so that I can mess around with colors. Okay, so now we've just got our foreground background. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and just select this stuff in here. And this is a handy, this is one of the first things actually that I started doing when I was asking myself, well, in what ways can I make this new Photoshop thing? It's like 22 years ago. Uh, what capabilities can it have that my sketchbook doesn't have? And, uh, this is one of them. Okay, I've made a selection. I've hidden the selection, so it's still there. And now I'm going to hue saturation. And, you know, you can just go all over the place with that. But, uh, you know, obviously it won't be realistic if I go too crazy. But yeah, there we go. It's just different enough, right? Boom, we've got some kind of center that looks more interesting than it was before. Okay, I have almost no cools represented in this. And that's something that I, uh, you know, normally would really recommend is some cools. Gosh, what would I use here? Um, I'm gonna make a, I'm gonna make a magenta that's super dull. Boom. And I'm going to just get a touch of it into the undersides of these. Oh, yeah. All right, what's going on here? Deselect. There we go. Yeah, you know, this kind of thing always should be on its own layer. But I do think that having a slightly cooler color is a good idea. I'm also going to do a, a slight cooling in the background. Oh, yeah, see that? It also helps separate from that foreground flower. There we go. It do flattens the color scheme. And then I'm going to probably reduce its opacity just a touch. And then this is my last but not least. Now I'm just going to make a dull 
turquoisey. I'm not sure what that would be in the eternal palette, but something like that. And I'm just going to make a very, very light pass through here with uh, with this. Uh, it's probably not dark enough. There we go. Oh, that's the problem. That's an eraser. And that's just a little bit of cool to uh, balance everything else out. And I think that's enough. I think I have kept you good folks long enough. So here's, here's where we're at. And I'm going to go ahead and bring this reference back to the foreground. Okay, so that's what we started with. And obviously this is not an improvement on that, but it is a translation into a tattoo design that has a focused high priority foreground element. And uh, if I had more time, I think I would take these black outlines a little darker onto about there, maybe black there. Uh, you know how it is, it just bugs you, right? Okay. That'll just give us a little bit more priority. There we go. And I'm gonna do, you know, I've, I've learned to be less afraid of black and floral tattoos, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to show you guys that Damon Conklin drawing. but since outlines are just so good at helping determine priority. And I, you know, with these color gradient lines, you can do this, you know, you can kind of skip from black to red to whatever, uh, go darker in the nooks and crannies and then lighter towards the tips, or whatever seems to, to bring it out the right way. Okay, now I'm gonna call because, yeah, we're an hour and 15, um, which isn't terrible. Um, by my standards, I know there's Photoshop artists that could just blow me out of the water in that amount of time. But uh, I'm not trying to show off here. I was trying to do something that you guys could kind of work along with. And uh, it's sort of within all of our capabilities. And, uh, you know, of course, all of our number one skill set is putting tattoos on people. And this is all a subset of that. So digital skills, if they're not directly applying towards making a better tattooer, then they're, you know, probably not a good use of your time. But I definitely have found uh, that learning these tools has just allowed me to go a little bit deeper into the design process, explore things a little bit more, you know, across different variations and that kind of thing in ways that, uh, you know, back in the old analog days when I would do a complete finished colored pencil rendering of everything, um, you know, you didn't see any variations back then. So it's all a good thing. But anyway, I thank you all for tuning in. Oh, actually, wait, before we go, we were going to give away a subscription, weren't we? Gabe, you still there? And do we have the giveaway thing I working? I am still here. Yeah, if there's... Um people that are in the chat room or we could do something with the uh, Instagram. Okay. Well, no, I would like to do it as quick as possible. Uh, that's right. We're not using Maestro, so we don't have the giveaway feature. So, uh, hmm. What was it? Was reinventing drawing? Uh? Yeah, I was going to give away a reinventing uh, what, what's a the drawing hashtag? group. Yes. Tell you what, how's this sound? Uh, we'll do something with the uh, reinventing drawing group. Uh, I'm going to uh, count how many there are, and I'm going to uh, just put the numbers in a hat. 
and uh, have my daughter pull it out of a hat. And tomorrow, we, well, actually later tonight, uh, when I post this with the uh, um, the hashtag, I will uh, announce the the uh, the winner for this. So uh, yeah. Um, and then before you go, could you just uh, flip your phone back around and give a real good like smile, like healthy smile to the thumbnail? Oh, uh, me right now. Okay. Hey, all right. Thank you again for tuning in, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you at our next exercise. We're probably going to have one next week, but we're definitely doing a minimum of two of these a month for subscribers and at least one, you know, usually at the virtual tattoo gathering. It will be open to the public. But, you know, at my peak, I'm hoping to do one of these every week. And then uh, I'm also going to be doing some live tattooing uh, sessions uh, later on. Let's see, next Thursday and Friday, possibly Wednesday too, but definitely Thursday and Friday. Uh, and we'll, we'll be tuning in for at least one of those. And that's different from Instagram because we can get really technical. So that's going to be for uh, subscribers only. Uh, we hope to see you all in uh, our next events. And we'd love to hear your feedback about what you think of this exercise and uh, exercises you would like to uh, do in the future, things you would love to have help with, uh, the places where you are stumped, uh, if, if you give us your feedback, we can try to address all of those things. Thank you.